Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as everybody's uh, settling down and gathering, I'll just, um, I want to use the first couple of minutes here to welcome all of you to Grand Rounds and also to um, uh, introduce our speaker. Um, and I'm very pleased that we had the opportunity to have this um, special Grand Rounds that uh, Dr. Christopher Palmer will be presenting for us today. Um, all of you know Dr. Palmer, but I want to give you a little bit of information because you may not really know all of his background. And we're very excited to have him uh, present this work that he's been um, doing in this last uh, number of years uh, to all of you. Dr. Palmer um, received his medical degree from Washington University School of Medicine and completed his internship and psychiatry residency at McLean Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. As all of you know, he's currently our director of the Department of Postgraduate and Continuing Medical Education at McLean Hospital and an assistant professor of psychiatry at HMS. Um, some things you might not know are that his clinical practice is focused on treatment-resisted cases for more than 20 years. And he's been looking through all of his clinical treatment for better treatments and better treatment outcome for his patients. And in that regard, one of the areas that he's worked on over this last 15 years or so is using the low carbohydrate and ketogenic diet in his practice, mostly for weight loss for his patients. But he's also recently found an antipsychotic and mood stabilizing effect from specific types of ketogenic diets. And so he's been pursuing clinical research in this area and um, has actually been speaking nationally and internationally on this topic, um, as well as consulting to patients from around the world. And we thought it was um, very appropriate, therefore, um, given his developing expertise in prescribing and motivating people to do the ketogenic diet, that not only should he have the opportunity to speak nationally and internationally, but maybe right here at McLean Hospital. So with that, please welcome Dr. Palmer. So thank you, Shelley, for that very kind introduction. Um, so I'm here to talk with all of you about the most controversial diet of the day, the ketogenic diet. I'm going to just put that out there and set the stage. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, let me give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to try to answer the question, what is the ketogenic diet, for those of you who don't know about it. Um, I'll tell you the story about the use of the ketogenic diet in epilepsy, because that's where it really started. I'll try to at least address the question, is this diet safe? because that is probably the most frequent question I get. How does this diet work? What is it doing to the body? I'll talk about the ketogenic diet and its use in medical conditions other than epilepsy, because there's a lot of research going on in these areas. And then I'll end with challenges in the future. So what is the ketogenic diet? So this is a diet that is very high in fat. It is low in carbohydrate, and it is moderate in protein. It was developed in the 1920s for the treatment of epilepsy. It results in the body using fat instead of carbohydrates as the primary source of energy. And this includes the brain. Most of us think that the brain requires glucose and can't do anything other than glucose. 70% of our brain um, neurons can actually use ketone bodies as their source of energy. 30% cannot. And that's why we have gluconeogenesis. But when people are in ketosis, the brain is primarily using ketone bodies for energy. So what does ketogenic mean? It simply means the production of ketone bodies from fat. There are three different types of ketone bodies, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. And these ketone bodies are actually measurable in blood, breath, and urine so that clinicians and individuals who are doing this diet can objectively test for compliance with the diet. So one of the things that I love about using this diet and doing research on this diet is this is the only diet that you can actually do an objective test in a matter of seconds and tell whether the patient has complied with the diet or not. Um, every other diet, they can say, yeah, I'm eating lots of fruits and vegetables, I didn't eat a cookie, but you, know, you, you never know for sure. Um, this, this diet, I can tell for certain whether they are compliant with the diet. Um, it mimics the fasting state, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Most adults who do this diet lose weight, 
But people can maintain weight and you can even gain weight while doing this diet and that's especially important in children with epilepsy. So one of the biggest teaching points that I want to kind of drill home today is when you say ketogenic diet, that actually means probably at least 100 different things. When you say diet, people automatically just start assuming their own version of what a diet is. And that can mean healthy fruits and vegetables. That can mean all sorts of things. So I, when I say ketogenic diet, people are like, oh yeah, lots of fruits and vegetables. I'm like, no, that, that's not what this is at all. Um, so I want to describe some of these variations. And one of the biggest point, the reason I want to drill this point home is because these different versions of the ketogenic diet are not interchangeable and they do not have the same effects on the body. They, they all have their own place for certain indications, but you can't mix and match um, because some of them have very different effects. So the classic ketogenic diet is the one that was developed in the 1920s. And typically it's talked about as either a four to one or a three to one ratio. And what do I mean by that? I mean, four, so a four to one ratio diet is a four grams of fat for every one gram of everything else. Carbohydrate, protein, and anything else they're consuming. So alcohol is another macronutrient that gets thrown in there. Um, so that means four grams of fat for maybe 0.5 grams of protein and 0.5 grams of carbohydrate total. So 80 to 90% of your total calories are coming from fat because we all know fat has more calories than protein and carbohydrates. There's fasting and intermittent fasting. And why do I put those in there? Because those are actually the many thousand year old version of achieving ketosis. And these are sometimes added to a ketogenic diet regimen in order to boost ketone levels when necessary. So sometimes if somebody's ketone levels are low and therapeutically you need them to be higher, you might have them skip a meal, you might even have them skip a whole day of meals in order to get their ketone levels higher. There's the MCT ketogenic diet. MCT stands for medium chain triglycerides. It's usually coconut oil. The reason that's important is because MCT oil is more easily converted into ketones than other sources of fat. So if you do the MCT ketogenic diet, you can actually get away with a little more protein and a little more carbohydrate in the diet. It's a little less strict. There's the Atkins diet and the low carb, high fat. LCHF is kind of the contemporary way to say Atkins diet, but um, those are primarily for weight loss. There's the modified Atkins diet, which is actually used for the treatment of epilepsy. The modification is to actually add more fat than the regular Atkins diet allows. So you do the Atkins diet, but you're constantly trying to add more sources of fat. Um, there is the low glycemic index treatment, which is not ketogenic, but it is a treatment used in epilepsy sometimes. There are ketone supplements, and this is a hot area of research. You can actually take a beta-hydroxybutyrate supplement, and you will therefore have ketones in your bloodstream. It is not at all clear that that will produce the same effects as the ketogenic diet, because I'll talk a little bit about this. The ketogenic diet is having profound metabolic effects on the body. And then there are websites and books and self-proclaimed experts who talk about the ketogenic diet for weight loss, for bodybuilding, for anything that ails you. And, um, and so you really have to watch out about your sources of information because there are lots of people who have really nice looking websites and sometimes they have good recipes. But um, you really have to kind of watch your sources of information if you're using this for a medical condition. So, so when I say four to one ratio, three to one ratio, usually that goes over people's heads. And so this picture is great at really kind of illustrating what I mean when I say these ratios. So if I can draw your attention to this green plate down here. So these actually, let me just say, these four plates are all meals. They all have the exact same ingredients and they are all the same number of calories. It is a 400 calorie meal composed of chicken breast, broccoli, uh, mayonnaise and olive oil. Down here in green, this is the typical Atkins diet, low carbohydrate, chicken and broccoli, but you might modify the Atkins diet to add a little more fat. So you add a little bit of 
mayonnaise with a little splash of olive oil in here. And that would be, this or this would be the modified Atkins diet. But this is what most people think of as a low carb diet. If you have epilepsy and you are trying the four to one ratio ketogenic diet, this is your meal. It's not at all a normal serving of chicken. It's not at all a normal serving of broccoli. You have to, you have to consume all of this mayonnaise. And then in the syringe, there's olive oil. And when I first saw this picture, I was really turned off by the syringe and thought, why do they have to put a syringe there? And now I love the syringe. And I love the syringe for two reasons. Number one, it says that if you're doing the four to one ratio diet, you actually have to be that meticulous in measuring how much fat, how many carbohydrates, how much everything you're getting, number one. And number two, people who are doing a four to one ratio diet are doing it for medical reasons. It's a medical prescription. And so the syringe represents that this is your medicine. So what else can you eat when you're on a ketogenic diet? So here are some staples um, of the ketogenic diet, steak, salmon, butter, a coconut, and that can take the form of coconut oil, coconut cream. There's olive oil, bulletproof coffee. If any of you have been to the West Coast, bulletproof coffee is taking off. And this is coffee with butter and MCT oil added to it. And you put it in a blender and blend it up. And it really is like a big craze on the West Coast. Uh, bacon and eggs, that would be a typical breakfast. But you can have spinach, low carbohydrate vegetables. You can have avocados, which are high in fat. People get creative, and you can have a um, you can have a pizza where the crust is made out of cauliflower or almond flour, and you can even have ice cream. And ice cream, this kind of ice cream is made with real cream, 100% cream, whipping cream. So it's extraordinarily decadent. Um, and is really high in fat, so if you need to add more fat, instead of having that syringe of olive oil, you might have some ice cream instead. So let me tell you the story about the ketogenic diet and epilepsy, because this is real, really where the story begins in terms of medical uses of this diet. And it starts with the observation that fasting stops seizures. Most people don't know that, but Hippocrates wrote about it, and it's been written about ever since the time of Hippocrates that if you have a person who is having seizures, if you fast them, the seizures will stop in most people. In 1921, Dr. Raoul Galen reported in the modern medical literature this observation. He put it to the test. It's not just a wife, an old wives tale. It's not just a religious folklore thing. It actually works. That if I, I fast this kid, he stops seizing. The problem is that once the kids start eating again, the seizures come right back. You can't fast somebody forever because if you fast them too long, that's starvation. And so it was really the ingenious Dr. Russell Wilder at the Mayo Clinic who came up with the ketogenic diet. The, he came up with the ketogenic diet that is super high in fat to mimic the fasting state, to get the same metabolic benefits of fasting but allowing that kid to not go into starvation mode and allowing that child to thrive and grow. I want to say for the record, he didn't develop this diet as the new health trend. He didn't think of it as a nutrient-rich diet. He developed it to stop seizures in people who had no other option. The early results were actually quite impressive. 50% of people who did this diet were seizure-free and another 35% were markedly improved. But by 1950, it fell out of favor because we developed better anti-seizure medications, and taking a medication is a hell of a lot easier than doing this diet. But it was rediscovered in the 1970s at Johns Hopkins, because lo and behold, 30% of patients even today do not respond to any of our anti-seizure medications, and even, psychosur even surgeries, um, neurostimulators, all of it. 30% of patients have treatment, refractory, treatment-resistant epilepsy. And the resurgence of this diet really is attributable to a man named Jim Abrahams. So Jim Abrahams is a famous movie producer. He produced Airplane and lots of other movies. And he had a son named Charlie. And Charlie was two years old. 
and Charlie was seizing multiple times a day, every single day. And Jim Abrahams, being a man of means, took Charlie to every specialist in the United States and abroad that he could think of. Charlie was tried on dozens and dozens of anti-epileptic medications. None of them stopped his seizures. Charlie had brain surgery. That did not stop his seizures. Jim Abrahams took it upon himself to do his own research, and he came upon this description of the ketogenic diet. He found the one physician in the world who was actually using the ketogenic diet at Johns Hopkins. He flew Charlie there. Charlie was admitted to the hospital, and he was fasted for 24 hours and then started on the ketogenic diet. Within four days, Charlie's seizures completely stopped. Within two months, Charlie was off all anti-epileptic medications and remained seizure-free. Four years later, Charlie stopped the ketogenic diet and has remained seizure-free to this day. Charlie is now thriving and in his 20s. Jim Abrahams was so upset that nobody offered this option to him that he had Dateline do a Dateline show about it. He actually produced a movie starring Meryl Streep to bring awareness to this. And now there are over 100 ketogenic diet centers around the world. But I have to say they almost exclusively specialize in the treatment of childhood epilepsy, and that's it. They are run by child, child neurologists, and they usually don't want to deal with other types of patients. So where do we stand now? There was a Cochrane review done in 2016, included seven randomized trials with over 400 children and adolescents. At three months, seizure freedom rates are as high as 55%, and these are treatment resistant. These are kids who have exhausted everything else. Um, at three months, up to 85% have a 50% or greater reduction in seizures. The modified Atkins diet is not as effective as the four to one ratio diet. And in one series, after one year, 55% of comers remained on the diet because it was clearly doing something beneficial. 45% had discontinued it because it was, it was either too difficult or it wasn't working for them. So is this diet safe? I say all that fat and all of you are kind of horrified. Oh my God, everybody's gonna drop dead of a heart attack. Um, so let me go through safety. So there are some contraindications to doing this diet. There are rare metabolism, um, fat metabolism disorders, which for the most part, most people don't need to worry about. Um, those are kids with rare syndromes and the syndrome is usually apparent for lots of other reasons. Porphyria is a contraindication. Pregnancy and breastfeeding are relative contraindications. Some people get really upset about this. But the, but the clear answer I give is that if you were pregnant, I would not recommend that you fast for nine months. And therefore, I would not recommend that you do a ketogenic diet for nine months. Likewise, if you're breastfeeding. Pancreatitis is a relative contraindication because all that fat may exacerbate pancreatitis. But there are no case reports, not even one, of anybody's pancreatitis being exacerbated by this diet. And kidney stones are a relative contraindication because in the old days, in addition to restricting everything else, they also water restricted you. And so people were more likely to get kidney stones. We don't water restrict anymore. That there, there's no benefit to that. And so um, kidney stones are less of a risk. Vitamins and supplements. So this diet does not provide enough nutrients from food. So at a minimum, you have to take a multivitamin, calcium with vitamin D, and um, early on, people get very dehydrated. So as the glycogen leaves your body, it takes water with it. People in the first few days of doing this diet will lose oftentimes five, 10 pounds. A lot of that's water weight pounds, it's not fat. But as it's taking those fluids, um, it's taking electrolytes with it. So it's important to augment with sodium, potassium, and magnesium at a minimum. And then the first month of this diet can be really uncomfortable and even dangerous. So there's this thing called keto adaptation or keto flu where people get weak, dizzy, lightheaded, they have cravings, they're irritable. Um, and that is your body trying to adjust from using carbohydrates as energy to using fat. And it's, it's kind of a painful withdrawal process. But for people who are diabetic and on medication or for people who have hypertension and are on medication, this diet can be dangerous if it's not medically supervised because your blood sugar will in fact precipitously drop 
and your blood pressure can drop. Those are great things, but if you're on medication for a blood sugar of 300 and now your normal blood sugar is actually 120, you better get that medication adjusted pretty quickly. It can also be difficult to tell the difference between severe hypoglycemia and keto flu. So you don't want to just send people out and tell them to wing it and do this diet and tough through that keto flu if you think they are having potentially life-threatening hypoglycemia. So I strongly recommend, and this, is not the, this isn't the medical recommendation like before you get on a treadmill, like consult with your physician. This is, this is the, this is the um, recommendation that like, please don't do this diet in anyone with epilepsy, diabetes, serious mental illness, cancer, and possibly some other ones, unless you, the clinician, know what you're doing and you have clearly spoken with the patient about all of the risks and how to monitor those and how to ameliorate any problems. So, but the real question on everyone's mind is not any of those, is what about all that fat? That fat has to be bad for you. So the American Heart Association has its dietary guidelines, and I put them here. Eat an overall healthy dietary pattern that emphasizes lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy products. So those first three, you can see, are all carbohydrates. So these are all carbs. This is a pretty much almost 100% carbohydrate diet with maybe a little protein from the dairy. And then you get skinless, no fat, skinless poultry and fish, nuts and legumes, maybe some fat in the nuts, and non-tropical vegetable oils. They hate coconut oil um, because it's mostly saturated fat. So the American Heart Association hates this diet, um, and I'm just going to put it out there. Um, U.S. News and World Report. Um, U.S. News and World Report this year had a panel of um, nationally ranked experts in diet, nutrition, obesity, food psychology, diabetes, and heart disease, ranked the 40 most popular diets, and the ketogenic diet was ranked last. And why is there so much concern? Well. The biggest basis for the concern is that people's LDL often does go up, especially if they eat a lot of saturated fat. That's the concern. But we now know from research over the last 10 or so years, there has not been one clinical study that has directly linked the consumption of saturated fat with cardiovascular disease outcomes. Not one. It's not for a lack of trying. The Women's Health Initiative studied 48,000 women, randomized half of them to the American Heart Association low-fat diet, and half of them to just keep eating what you want to eat. And there was absolutely, so the women who ate the low-fat diet had their LDL go down. It did go down. Their blood pressure even went down. And there was absolutely no difference in cardiovascular outcomes or stroke rates in those women. But we continue to ignore data like that because it doesn't sit well with our paradigm. And our paradigm is low-fat diets have to be good for us. But we, I, I'm going to present a lot more data. And, but we continue to ignore the data. Um, because we don't like it, we don't want to change, we've all been taught fat is bad for us, and that's a really hard thing to change. It's a hard thing to change people's minds. Additionally, so, so there are different types of LDL, and what we know is that there are small, dense LDL particles that confer the highest risk for cardiovascular disease. And these small, dense LDL particles are actually increased by low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets, not saturated fat. There's another type of LDL, which are larger, fluffier LDL particles that are, in fact, increased by saturated fat. And so a lot of people think, well, you know, are you just talking crazy? Like, why are you trying to split up LDL? Well, prior to the 1980s, believe it or not, we had one and only one measure. It was called cholesterol. There was no HDL, no LDL. It was all called cholesterol. And cholesterol, we knew, we knew with certainty cholesterol was bad for us. Yet there were all of these people who had really high cholesterol levels and they, their veins and arteries were clear. And we couldn't figure out why was that. 
And then somebody made a discovery that, oh, actually, there's this HDL cholesterol, which is actually good for us. The higher, the better, because it's cleaning out our arteries. And then there's LDL, which is the evil toxic. And, and it may be time to rethink how we conceptualize LDL. And it may be time to kind of recategorize. But LDL in and of itself is not the whole story. There's HDL, triglycerides, glucose, and diet has a profound effect on lots of risk factors, not just LDL. Evidence of saturated fat causing heart disease is now being questioned. I've spoken to that a little bit. If you really want to do a deep dive, this book by Gary Tobbs, who's a New York Times journalist, um, he goes through almost every study that's been done linking saturated fat with bad outcomes and gives, I think, pretty objective data. And then there are prospective studies on the effects of the ketogenic diet on weight loss and diabetes that actually show improvement in cardiac risk factors. And I'm going to present some of those to you. So next, I want to present this recent epidemiology study. So this appeared in Lancet in the last year. It is the largest prospective study where we actually asked people, what are you eating? They categorized it into how much fat, how much saturated fat, how much protein, how, many, how much carbohydrate, and then they looked at health outcomes. This study included over 135,000 people from 18 countries for over seven years. The primary outcomes were total mortality and major cardiovascular events. And I'm just going to cut to the chase. What they did find is people who ate the most saturated fat had higher levels of LDL and higher blood pressure. So what do you predict the outcomes for that group would be? Well, here, it's a complicated graph, but these are all of the results. So on the top, you have charts for total mortality, de death from all causes. On the bottom, you have major cardiovascular disease. And then in each column, you have a different macronutrient. This first one is how much fat are people eating? This next one is saturated fat and carbohydrates down here. We've got polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. So if, let me take you to this graph right here. So what this says is people who ate the least amount of fat in their diet, they're on a low fat diet, had the highest mortality. People who ate the most fat in their diet had the lowest mortality. What about cardiovascular disease? Same deal. People who ate the least amount of fat had the highest mortality. People who ate the most fat had the lowest, or uh, cardiovascular disease had the lowest rate of cardiovascular disease. Totally flies in the face of the AHA recommendations. But again, they, I don't think they want to know about this study. They've kind of written it off. People at, a lot of people aren't even talking about it, even though it was the best done study. So what about saturated fat? Because, you know, they're healthy fats, right? So, oh, they must all be eating olive oil, the Mediterranean diet. That's what it is. Well, what about saturated fat? People who ate the least amount of saturated fat had the highest mortality. People who ate the most saturated fat had the lowest mortality. This was statistically significant. What about cardiovascular disease? This was a non-statistically significant association. You can see from the chart, people who ate the least amount of saturated fat had the highest cardiovascular disease. But then the chart kind of is basically even. It's a flat line, meaning that, statistically speaking, it's a flat line, meaning that whether you eat a little bit of saturated fat or a lot of saturated fat, it didn't have an effect on cardiovascular events. What about carbohydrates? I, I point your attention over here. People who were ate the least amount of carbohydrates, so a low-carb diet, had the lowest mortality. People who ate the most carbohydrates in their diet had the highest mortality. And what about cardiovascular disease? Similar, low and high. And what about saturated fat and stroke? So I told you saturated fat was not statistically significantly associated with cardiovascular events, but with strokes, it unequivocally was. There was a clear linear relationship between it, uh, um, saturated fat intake and stroke rates, and it's exactly the opposite of what most of you probably think. So here, you see people who ate the lowest amount of saturated fat 
had the highest stroke rates, people who ate the least amount of saturated fat had the lowest stroke rates. The conclusion in this Lancet study was that our dietary guidelines are potentially doing harm and they need to seriously be reevaluated, but we'll see if that happens. But what about cancer? This is from Dr. Simprea. What about cancer? Eating all that fat has to cause cancer. Well, this quote comes from the Harvard School of Public Health website. Researchers once suspected an association between dietary fat and common cancers. However, in adults, the percentage of calories consumed from total fat appears to have no significant association with cancer risk, and there is currently no clear evidence linking any specific type of fat that includes saturated fat with cancer incidence. But we've all heard that fat causes cancer, right? So let me clear up maybe some of that confusion. You go to the National Cancer Institute, being fat does increase your risk of cancer, 13 different types of cancer. And unfortunately, when people report these associations, they often go to what we all know as fact. So therefore, if you are overweight or obese, you should reduce the amount of fat in your diet so that you can lose weight, so that you will be at lower risk of cancer. What the data actually says is that being overweight or obese is the risk for cancer, not consuming fat. So how does this body work, this, or how does this diet work? What's it doing to the body? This diet stops seizures in some people. What is it doing? This is not an exhaustive list. There are actually lots of other cutting edge kind of um, science inquiries into what, what effects this diet is having on the body. But some of them um, are listed here. It lowers blood sugar and insulin levels. It decreases leptin. For any of you who know about leptin, you probably think that's counterintuitive. So leptin is the hormone that actually makes you feel full. But interestingly, leptin is like insulin in that there is leptin resistance. And people who are obese tend to have very high levels of leptin, even though it's supposed to be making them feel full, because their leptin receptors aren't getting the signal. Their body is trying desperately to make them feel full, but the receptors aren't getting the signal. People doing this diet have sensitized leptin receptors, and so their leptin levels actually come down. And the, re the, the reality is people doing this diet often actually say, I feel fine. I'm not hungry. I eat as much as I need to eat. I'm good. The first month, not so, but later, yes. This diet produces ketone bodies, which are an alternate source of energy instead of glucose. And I'm going to talk about some glucose regulation disorders and why providing an alternate source of energy might be, have a clinical effect. It changes neurotransmitter systems. And for the scientists in the room, I know this is an oversimplification, but it does increase on the whole GABAergic neurotransmission. It decreases glutamatergic neurotransmission. It increases adenosine, and it changes ion channel regulation. We know this because the epilepsy people are trying to figure out how does this diet work. These are all anti-seizure effects, but they also have an important role in psychiatric disorders. This one is really exciting because it, um, it's about structural change in the body. This, when people are on this diet, it actually increases mitochondrial function and increases the production of mitochondria. Your cells will have more mitochondria as a result of doing this diet. I want to say that, I want to kind of stop there and just say all of these mechanisms of action are primarily based on a four to one ratio diet. If you're doing the, you know, the website or the popular book diet version, lose a few pounds version of the diet, it's not at all clear that you're getting these physiologic effects. We know that it also increases polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are thought to be neuroprotective, and it decreases inflammation. So let's talk about the ketogenic diet and what else is it being studied for. So here's a big laundry list, and there are case reports and or clinical trials on all of these disorders. And the first thing I want to say to you is when you see a slide, when you see anybody claim that a treatment will treat all sorts of different disorders, please be skeptical. And so I invite your skepticism now. Um, 
The reality is a lot of these disorders are brain disorders, and the brain is highly energy dependent. It uses, it's the organ that uses the most energy. And given that we're providing an alternate energy source and we're ramping up mitochondria, which process energy, that might be the unifying theme of maybe it really is legitimately affecting some of these disorders. By no means is it a cure for all of these. So let me just say that up front. It is not. So now I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour through some of the data on how it's used in medicine. And the most common one is weight loss, and so I have to talk about weight loss. So when we talk about weight loss, there ends up being a lot of um, overlap and confusion between low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets. So all diets that are ketogenic are in fact low in carbohydrate. Not uh, all low carbohydrate diets are not necessarily ketogenic. So you can be on a low carbohydrate diet, eat a lot of protein, and you may not be in ketosis. So that's still a low carb diet. But the use of low carb or ketogenic diets for weight loss dates back to 1825. Dr. Brilat Savarin wrote about the link between carbohydrates and obesity. William Banting was a famous wealthy man who had tried lots of different diets and could never lose weight. He was overweight. He kept trying everything he could think of. And he finally did a low carbohydrate diet. And it worked. And people were really interested in this. So he wrote a pamphlet, The Letter on Corpulence. And that pamphlet was actually the most popular diet book of its time. He gave it away for free. He didn't need the money. He actually just wanted to help people um, lose weight and spare them the frustration that he had endured trying so many different diets that all failed to work for him. His last name actually became a verb. So around the end, around the 1800s, um, people would, instead of saying they were dieting, they would say, I'm banting, which was, I'm doing a low carb diet to lose weight. Um, and, and then you see the other ones. So Dr. Atkins' diet revolution is probably the most famous. There was the South Beach diet. The, the one in 1967, the Doctor's Quick Weight Loss Diet, that actually sold two and a half million copies. And one thing I just want to point out about this timeline. So one of the biggest criticisms of the low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet is don't do that fad diet. Oh, it's just the latest fad. Don't do another fad diet. How many centuries does a dietary intervention need to be tried and true and promoted and found successful by millions of people? How many centuries need to go by before we stop calling it a fad diet? So when we talk about this, this is getting a lot of popular press. The New York Times Magazine, what if fat doesn't make you fat? Time Magazine says eat butter. Scientists used to think that fat was the enemy, why they were wrong. So do we have anything in the medical literature? We actually do. This, um, this study appeared in JAMA, comparison of the Atkins, the Zone, the Ornish, and the Learn diets in premenopausal women, over, over 300 women. It was a randomized controlled trial. The Atkins diet group lost the most weight and had the most favorable metabolic cardiac profile. This article appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, 132 severely obese subjects, many of them with diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Subjects who got the low carb diet compared to the low fat diet lost more weight, they had lower triglycerides, and they had improved insulin sensitivity. Just in JAMA this year, interest in the ketogenic diet grows for weight loss and type 2 diabetes. This is in JAMA. There was a meta-analysis comparing ketogenic diets with low-fat diets for long-term weight loss. And what did they find? It included 13 studies. Ketogenic diet resulted in more weight loss, lower triglycerides, decreased diastolic blood pressure, increased HDL, and here's the reason the American Heart Association hates this diet, increased LDL. There was another meta-analysis of low-fat diets versus other diets for long-term weight loss. 53 studies, over 68,000 subjects. In case you think I'm cherry-picking my data, 
This meta-analysis, 53 studies, 68,000 subjects, low-carb diets led to more weight loss than low-fat diets. Higher fat diets led to more weight loss than low fat diets. Let me say that again. If you have a patient who wants to lose weight, telling them to eat more fat will result in more weight loss than telling them to reduce the fat in their diet. This is what our evidence base says. We can continue to ignore it, but if we're going to practice evidence-based medicine at some point, we need to pay attention to the evidence. So why, why would these things make a difference? Isn't a calorie just a calorie? And this gets into a very controversial area about metabolism. What we know is that when people lose weight, their metabolism goes down. So your body's actually fighting against you, trying to make you regain all of your weight. When you calorie restrict, your metabolism goes down. So even when people say, but I'm dieting, I'm really doing it, I'm not eating as much, and I'm not losing a pound, they're actually really telling you the truth. They're not, because their metabolism has compensated and they can't lose weight. So, but there's a, this big debate. And um, so this JAMA article studied 21 overweight people. They locked them into a metabolic chamber of a hospital and they fed them um, calorie equivalent, low fat diets, low glycemic index diets, very low carbohydrate diets. All 21 subjects got all three diets in different order. And what they found is that metabolism decreased the most with the low fat diet, meaning the low fat diet is working against you the best. Low glycemic index was intermediate and people who were on the very low carbohydrate diet had the least change in their metabolism. Thurl did another study where they compared five diets, but this was an overfeeding paradigm, which is different than weight loss. And what they found was that metabolism increased the most in people who eat a high protein diet, regardless of carbohydrate or fat content. So bodybuilders know this. If you eat a lot of protein, you gain muscle, and mus muscle is associated with metabolism. It's interesting, these two concepts are not mutually exclusive, though. So if we take these together, one would say a low-carbohydrate diet that's high in protein, and that actually is some of those trendy diets like the Atkins diet that I've talked about that have been sold to millions and millions of people because it worked. Let's talk about type 2 diabetes. In 2012, 14% of the United States population had frank diabetes, and another 38% had prediabetes. That is half of the adult population of the United States has prediabetes or diabetes. We have a crisis, and it's growing, and whatever we're recommending is not working. Low-carbohydrate diets, lower glucose for most but not all diabetics, why? Because protein can be converted into glucose via gluconeogenesis. And therefore, for some people with diabetes, it's important to restrict both carbohydrates and only eat moderate amounts of protein, not an unlimited protein diet. There's a systematic review and meta-analysis of carbohydrate restriction in patients with type 2 diabetes. What they found is that people on a low-carb diet had a greater reduction in hemoglobin A1c compared to people with a high-carb diet probably not surprising. The greater the carbohydrate restriction, the greater the glucose lowering effect. Not shocking. What's also not surprising is that at one year, there were no differences in either of the groups because people with type 2 diabetes are notoriously, it, it's notoriously difficult to get them to do a diet and stay on a diet. So there's a group out in California that has developed this very intensive virtual model of treating patients. It's called the Verta Clinic. And they have published their data on about 350 adults. The in, so what they provide is they provide virtual medical monitoring, but also coaching and virtual support groups. What they, the intervention group got the ketogenic diet and all this medical monitoring. The usual care group, no change. And the usual care group, not surprisingly, had no change in their weight, hemoglobin A1C, or use of diabetes meds. The people who got this intensive intervention, average hemoglobin A1C decreased from 7.6 to 6.3. 6.5 is the cutoff to call it diabetes. On average, people lost 12% of their body weight, or 30 pounds. 
It reduced, they reduced diabetes medicine use. 94% of insulin users reduced or eliminated insulin. Sulfonyl ureas were eliminated completely in the intervention group. 25% of patients were off all diabetes meds and maintained a normal hemoglobin A1C, and another 35% were taking only metformin. But what about all that fat? They're probably dropping dead of heart attacks, right? Well, they did safety profiles of all of these patients, and the, the, the intervention patients are seen in blue, and the usual care patients are seen in gray. And anything to this side of the graph is improvement in cardiovascular profile. Anything to this side of the graph is um, worsening of the cardiovascular profile. And I want to call your attention to LDL, because this is where the American Heart Association will just, with a laser eye, focus. And LDL increased in the intervention group, and it improved in the control group because they were probably getting statins. But if you look at the overall risk profile, which is used to determine whether somebody is a candidate for a statin, the intervention group actually had better scores. Why? Because they had much better triglycerides, HDL, uh, and, and other risk factors. So now I'm going to move on to really my kind of new and emerging area of interest, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So this audience knows this already. Schizophrenia affects about 1% of the population. Bipolar disorder, 2 to 5% of the population. There's a lot of overlap in symptoms and diagnoses, and these disorders seem to share pathophysiology, at least in some ways. And I, w I just want to say, I, I'm a psychiatrist. I love psychiatry. I love what we do. We all do our best. But our treatment outcomes are poor. This three-year observational study of adults with schizophrenia, over 6,000 of them, each and every one of them on an antipsychotic medication. Only one third were without positive symptoms for two years or more during this three year study. So that means two thirds of patients continue to have hallucinations and delusions despite treatment. Only one quarter reported an adequate quality of life. Three quarters report a poor quality of life. Only 13% were able to work or go to school. And when you put these all together, that's what they called recovery. 4% of patients with schizophrenia had a recovery. This is with the best treatments that we have to offer. Unfortunately for people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, there are also a lot of physical health concerns. People who are diagnosed with schizophrenia are three times more likely to develop diabetes than people in the general population. After first hospitalization for psychosis, this study followed patients for 20 years. Two-thirds of patients diagnosed with schizophrenia were obese at 20 years. And over half of those with bipolar disorder became obese. And those rates are much higher than the general population. And then there's decreased life expectancy in people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. People diagnosed with schizophrenia have a reduction in lifespan of anywhere from 10 to 25 years, depending on what study you look at. And people with bipolar disorders, lifespan is reduced by 9 to 20 years. And the primary cause of that is cardiovascular disease. Suicide is a factor, but cardiovascular disease and cancer, I told you obesity is related to cancer, Cancer and cardiovascular disease are killing our patients. So why consider the ketogenic diet? Well, I just gave you three reasons. I presented data on decreasing mortality. I presented data on losing weight. And I presented data on treating obesity or treating diabetes with this diet. So why else consider it? Well, number one, empirically, Treatments that work for epilepsy often work for psychiatric disorders. We use a lot of Depakote, we use a lot of Lamotrigine, we use benzodiazepines interchangeably. And so what works for epilepsy may in fact work for psychiatric disorders. And given that the ketogenic diet works pretty well for some, ep for some patients with epilepsy, we should at least consider it. We know that mitochondrial dysfunction and disturbances in energy metabolism have been implicated in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression. Joe Stonger here has done a lot of work on that. 
Abnormalities in glucose metabolism are often seen in first episode non-treated schizophrenia, so it's not just the medications. The medications certainly add insult to injury, but it's not just them. And then I've shared with you the ketogenic diet changes neurotransmitter sy systems, inflammation that may also play a role. So do we have any data? So there's at least a theoretical construct. Do we have any data? In 2015, there was published a mouse model of schizophrenia, and the ketogenic diet normalized the pathological behaviors that coincided with positive, negative, and cognitive symptoms, which is very different than the typical antipsychotic profile in this mouse paradigm. And then human data go back all the way to 1965. A pilot study in 10 women with schizophrenia found an effect of the ketogenic diet on their psychotic symptoms. The effect went away when they stopped the diet. This 2002 study I put in here for fairness, but also as a teaching point. So this was a 49-year-old woman with bipolar disorder. They put her on a ketogenic diet. She said she was doing the ketogenic diet, and they reported it didn't work. But she never had ketones in her urine, and she didn't lose any weight. So she was not doing the ketogenic diet. She probably thought she was, and the researchers probably thought she was, but without objective evidence, this is clear cut. This is yes or no. You either have ketosis or you don't. So in 2009, these researchers from Duke University reported a 70-year-old woman who had had schizophrenia since age 17. She had daily auditory and visual hallucinations. She was in and out of the hospital. She attempted suicide multiple times. She started a ketogenic diet, and I think it was within eight days, her auditory and visual hallucinations went away and stayed away for a year. This woman is still alive, and I'm working with these researchers to publish another report, so stay tuned. Um, in 2013, there was a report of using this diet for patients with type 2 bipolar disorder. Both patients were able to get off all medications, and patients and psychiatrists all agreed that the patients were better on the ketogenic diet than they had ever been on any of the medication trials. And then I recently published two case reports that I am happy to share with you now. So I will quickly describe them. The first person is a woman. I'll call her Kathy. 32-year-old single woman, had a history of anorexia, had mild depression in adolescence. She had a family history of bipolar disorder. Her depression started getting worse, and I was treating her, and we tried psychotherapy for a year and a half because I really didn't want to put her on anything else with family history of bipolar disorder. Her functioning continued to deteriorate. She wasn't able to go to school. We discussed pros and cons. We discussed all sorts of things. She wanted to go on an antidepressant. We tried an antidepressant. She got manic and psychotic within about three months and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and quickly became schizoaffective disorder because her psychosis didn't go away. She tried over 18 different psychiatric medications, including clozapine at 500 milligrams for over two years mood stabilizers, stimulants, and she had a course of ECT, 23 bilateral treatments. She was in a residential treatment program for two years where they monitored her medication compliance, so we know that wasn't it. And despite all of this treatment, she was plagued by delusions that God hated her, she was going to burn in hell, she really wanted to kill herself and end her suffering, but God might punish her even more, so she didn't think she should do that, but she was tempted every now and then. She attempted suicide several times. She, at one point, she had gained a lot of weight from all of this, and so at one point she says, I want to lose some weight. She's living with her boyfriend, and she had to have her boyfriend put a lock on the refrigerator because the medications she was on made her wake up in the middle of the night and sleep eat. And she couldn't really be accountable for that. So he put a lock on the refrigerator in the middle of the night. She went on a ketogenic diet. And within one month, she came in and said, you know what? I don't believe that God hates me. I, I actually don't think a lot of those things that I were ta was talking about are true anymore. I'm good. More importantly, she was smiling. She was happy. She was engaged started living her life. 
Her PAN score decreased from 107 to 70. She went to visit her family, her parents, who were not on a ketogenic diet and were not willing to lock the refrigerator, and stayed with them for two weeks and relapsed on the diet and unfortunately it relapsed in terms of her psychosis. She became floridly psychotic within about a week and a half of eating lots of carbohydrates and sweets. And she came in and saw me. We increased her Abilify because I was like, I gotta do something. You're like so, <laughs> so sick. But let's restart the diet. The diet wasn't working right away. It takes a while to work. So she took it upon herself to fast for three days. That was not my recommendation, but she did it. And after three days, her ketone levels were dramatically higher, and she comp reported, again, complete resolution of her symptoms. The second patient is a 33-year-old man that I'll call Matthew. He'd suffered from ADHD since childhood, had been on stimulants, got, was diagnosed as major depression in adolescence. He, too, was prescribed an antidepressant, got floridly manic and psychotic, and quickly got diagnosed as schizoaffective since 2003. He tried over 15 medications, including um, antipsychotics, stimulants, antidepressants, mood stabilizers. And despite all of this treatment, he gained about 120 pounds. And he was plagued by auditory hallucinations, delusions every single day. He could barely leave his father's home. When he did leave, he would look around, convinced that people were messing with his thoughts, and um, people were out to get him. They were going to harm him. So he came to me in January of 2016 and wanted to lose weight. I hadn't read all this other literature yet. <laughs> um, so he was actually my index patient. And I said, well, let's try the low-carb ketogenic diet because that can kind of work for weight loss. So he did that diet. And three weeks later, not only had he lost 15 pounds, but he actually really started to come to life. So if you imagine the negative symptoms of patients who are heavily medicated, the lack of facial expression, the lack of eye contact, haven't, hasn't showered in a week or two, doesn't necessarily wear clean clothes because why bother? He started coming to life. He looked at me, wanted conversation, wanted deep conversation. Eyes were starting to sparkle. And it, simultaneously, he said, you know what? My voices, they're like a lot lower for some reason. I don't know what's going on, but I feel great, and I'm really going. So after a year, he lost 110 pounds. His PAN score decreased from 98 to 49. The big caveat for him, he's not cured. Every time he relapses on the diet, his symptoms come back with a vengeance. Um, and even at best, his symptoms have never been to zero, but he's also never been able to do the version of the diet that gets him into the epilepsy treatment range of ketones. So we're working on that. So challenges in the future. The biggest point, again, I want to reiterate, there are many variations of this diet. Please don't leave here and just go tell your patients, go read a book on the ketogenic diet and do the ketogenic diet. Um, because it's all, they're all very different and they have different indications. There's a lot of conflicting and false information out there. It's extraordinarily difficult to do, especially in the first few weeks. Research on medical conditions is just beginning. This diet is shunned by the medical community. It is shunned by the lay community. It's really hard to do. Most clinicians aren't trained to implement and manage this. Um, it takes a lot of time to do this diet. So what does the future hold? We need more research, and we need to figure out ways to make this diet easier for people to do. I will stop there. Happy to entertain questions if people have any. Thanks, Chris. Um, so my question is, without the fasting part, is two weeks the soonest that you can see this sort of clinical impact? It, it's interesting because so there's a, a range at which people respond. So the Duke case, the Duke University case, reportedly responded pretty significantly after eight days. Most of the patients I've seen, it's taken about three to six weeks. So, um, and it's interesting because that's the same time frame that medications take to work. 
So I think it's more complicated than just providing a different fuel for the brain. I think it's something about upregulation of neurotransmitter receptors or something else happening um, that takes time. And likewise, when patients abruptly stop medications, they can have um, an exacerbation of illness within a day or two. And it's a similar thing with the diet. So this diet actually is like a medicine, at least in the experience I've had so far. Thank you very much for a great talk. So of course you and I have spoken and I think you're absolutely onto something here. I think this is very interesting. And you really at this point have more experience with this than probably any other psychiatrist in the world trying to get your patients to go on this. So um, what observations have you made? And, and, and also I guess the other thing to say is that adherence is, is a challenge. It's so hard to stay on this. And for our patients where behavior is the thing that's become abnormal, you know, getting them to stick to it may be even harder. So what observations have you made about, you know, how to approach this? What works? Or how to talk to patients? Or you know, what, how to set up the intervention so that it can be successful. Because as you said, if we all go back to our offices and we say, hey, here's a book, you know, read this book and do this diet, it's not going to work. So how should we be thinking about this? So, so I think, um, you know, I liken this to prescribing medications and, and also to addiction treatment. And there's a, it's complicated. So if I, if I asked Shelly, how do you get an alcoholic to stop drinking alcohol? She can't answer that in two sentences for me, because there are lots of <laughs> there, are lo there are lots of skills, lots of interventions. It's a work in progress, and so getting people to make a major dietary change is similar to the work in addiction treatment. I think. And how are you going to resist cravings? How can you get rid of stimuli that are going to tempt you? How how can you set up a different social system that will support your choice instead of encouraging you to, to, to break the diet. Um, but then, you know, the, the science part is that there actually is a lot known about getting this, doing this diet correctly. There are lots of foods that you're allowed to eat and not allowed to eat. And so being a resource for them or pairing up with somebody who is a resource, a skilled dietitian in the ketogenic diet can be really invaluable. Um, the other thing is that I, I tend to set expectations up front. And so I tell everybody, this diet is going to be hell for the first month. Because if you promise anything different, you're just setting yourself up for failure. So I just tell them, it's going to be hell. Just like I would tell an alcoholic, you know, withdrawal. It's going to be hell. <laughs> it's like, like, it's not going to be pleasant. Um, and I, but I think those are some of the things. So, but it's... There, there is a lot out there. There's a lot of knowledge, being a resource, um, setting appropriate expectations. I don't know. Hope that helps. Um, great talk. I just want to ask you because there is some evidence that the diet changes microbiome in, uh, in the guts and uh, that actually studies in mice uh, that spontaneously get seizures. They were treating first with the diet. They then used uh, and transplanted fecal transplants gave it to the mice, and it was as effective as diet. So what's the future with the fecal transplants? <laughs> Microbiome. Yeah, no, so people are actually studying this. So one of the known mechanisms with the ketogenic diet is it does change the gut microbiome. That's not shocking. Anytime you significantly change the diet, you're going to have a change in the bacteria. Do we know if that's a beneficial change or not? No, we don't. To the best of my knowledge, there is no no good research out there in the way that you described where, where we're going to do a fecal transplant and somebody's sim psychiatric symptoms are going to remit. Um, there's a little bit of data with anxiety, I think, in a mouse model, but that's a mouse model of anxiety. Um, and uh, with psychotic disorders, I'm not aware of any research. I do know some researchers who are, who are pursuing that line of work because they think it is the microbiome, but they think everything's the microbiome. So. <laughs> The, um, unfortunately, not great ones. So, so one of the things that I always do is I have conversations with the family members and or any supporting friends, allies, significant others. 
um, because that's a really important piece. The people in the home need to at least be on board with this um, because if they're not, it's almost doomed for failure. Um, but, uh, but you're right. It, um, it's hard. I'm, I'm arguing with primary care physicians all the time who are like, what are you doing? How dare you do it? I don't even get into the fat and cardiovascular event stuff. I'm like, if you don't want to accept the evidence as it exists in the medical literature, that's your prerogative. I get that change is hard. And, but the alternative for this patient is to give them Zyprexa or Clozapine which will make them gain 100 or 200 pounds, which will decrease their lifespan, which will potentially contribute to them getting diabetes. My diet is no worse than that. And at the end of the day, if my diet alleviates their suffering, then stop. Like if you had a child who is seizing every single day and you had already tried every other intervention and nothing had worked, and this is the intervention that works, are you really going to start worrying about the long-term health consequences of fat? And you're just going to, what, let your child seize multiple times a day every day and be completely disabled? Or you're going to give them an intervention and then worry about the long-term effects another day? Marion? Great talk. Thank um, you. So the, the, um, the diet that you are recommending for these people, is it the four to one ratio or is it more like Atkins three to one? It is, um, it varies with patients, honestly. So when you have a morbidly obese patient, they can do the regular Atkins diet and have high levels of ketosis. And that's fine. It, it's, it seems to be related to the metabolic effects of ketones. Um, I think the ketones are a good marker. So with the one patient that I described, he's stayed on the diet and is doing it two and a half years now and, um, and has kept all of his weight off. He's lost another 20 pounds, so he's at a, like 130 pound total weight loss. And it's much more difficult for him to achieve ketosis now. So he's actually, we're working on getting him to a two to one or a three to one ratio diet, um, which is difficult. Um, it's just difficult for anyone, but uh, yeah, it and, depends and, on their profile. And one other question, any, any experience with the effect of this diet around ECT? Does it do anything to seizure threshold or anything like that? I, I'm smiling because I actually just literally had a case in the last few weeks of somebody who is, came to me from California because they read about my research and everything else had failed. Their young son who was psychotic. Um, and so he did get, he's getting ECT or what might be wrapping up a course of ECT and was in ketosis at the time. And they never clearly said whether they had to increase the threshold or not, but they were able to administer adequate seizures. <laughs> Who do I refer my patients to? Refer your patients to for? Me. <laughs> um, I, would, I, would, I would be willing to work with you. I mean, there are ketogenic diet trainings available if you want to become an expert in it. Ideally, this is a team approach. So the ideal team would include a physician, and if you're treating psychiatric disorders, I would strongly recommend a psychiatrist. Um, so it might even be a psychiatrist, another physician fully versed in the ketogenic diet therapy and all of the complications of it, a dietitian, and then a team of coaches and others who will help patients out in the real world do this diet. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a real problem. The, the, the reality is for, so the, the one 70 year old woman with schizophrenia is completely off all medications. When you look at the costs of antipsychotic medications, thousands and thousands of dollars a year, insurance will pay for that. She was still suffering. 
She was plagued by daily auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, and was attempting suicide multiple times over several years. And on this diet, she is symptom free. She's lost 150 pounds and she's off all psychiatric meds. I think insurance should pay for this. They're going to need more evidence. I want to do, so, so the easy answer, if you really have patients who are interested in this, I'm hoping if I can get adequate funding to do a, a, a real deal inpatient controlled study in psychosis, so schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, and everything would be provided to those research participants. And anybody who does that study, if they want to maintain the diet afterward, I will gladly volunteer my time to support them in their efforts to continue it. Arthur? Would be the, as an antidote to the metabolic syndrome, if you would need to do a controlled study, but the, this diet may be the answer to the serious complications of new of second generation antipsychotics. We, so, so we already have abundant data. I shared some of it with you. There is abundant data that this diet completely ameliorates the metabolic syndrome, with one and only one exception: increased LDL. It improves every other parameter of metabolic syndrome. Blood pressure comes down. All other cholesterol profiles improve. Blood glucose comes down. Insulin sensitivity improves. It is very important. I actually. I showed you that data. It probably went past you. It's right here. So, so this is the total LDL, but I can't read it on my, the ApoB to ApoA1, the intervention group improved. The treatment as usual got worse. Triglycerides, there's a profound effect on triglycerides. Um, and again, take it all as a whole. The 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk profile dramatically improved for the intervention group, got worse for the usual care group. So we have data. At some point, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take to get people to maybe rethink LDL, that maybe, you know, it's clear and unequivocal. There is some very bad LDL. It tends to increase with high carbohydrate diets, but that LDL is toxic to our bodies and causes heart attacks and strokes. People who take statin drugs to reduce LDL, which is likely reducing both types of LDL, the, good, the, the, the bad kind clearly, but maybe, even, maybe the benign kind, um, people who take statin drugs have improved cardiovascular outcomes, especially as secondary prevention. And, and I think it's those pieces of information that make the American Heart Association cling to their data. That like, no, we know this is fact. We know that people who eat saturated fat have higher LDL. That's true. I've presented data on that. We know that people who have high LDL have higher cardiovascular disease rates. That's true. We do know that. But it assumes the LDL in equation one is the same as the LDL in equation two, and they're not the same. And because when you do the large-scale studies, 48,000 women, from you know, A leads to B, B leads to C, does A lead to C? Nobody has been able to do that study and show it. They've done the studies, and it's always been negative. And so there's something missing in our equation. We're not understanding something correctly. I've presented a hypothesis. I think there's at least enough data to think about it. At the end of the day, for my schizophrenic and bipolar patients who are suffering and miserable and on t medications that are clearly toxic to their longevity, I have no reservations at all about offering this diet. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>